To understand Bitcoin, you need to answer one question, which is who actually controls it. So in this video, I'll be breaking down how nodes work, how rules on the network are decided, and I'll walk you through the block size wars, a three-year history that reveals who actually controls Bitcoin. But before I get into the battles, let me lay the foundation by showing you how nodes and rules actually work. A Bitcoin node is any computer that runs the Bitcoin software, and when you run it, you choose which version you want to use, it connects to the network, and then it downloads the full history of all of the Bitcoin transactions. Nodes are often confused with miners, but they actually play two very different roles. Miners expend electricity to create blocks of transactions, Nodes don't compete for blocks, they just verify that all the transactions and blocks are following the rules. Think of Bitcoin like a soccer game. Miners are the players on the field, scoring goals and keeping the game moving. Nodes are the referees. They use the same rule book and decide if the goals count. If a miner breaks the rules, nodes reject that block and the goal doesn't count. This rule book is known as the consensus rules and it covers all of the core parts of how Bitcoin operates. Things like the 21 million coin supply cap, how rewards are halved, what makes a transaction transaction valid and how many transactions fit into each block. Anyone can run a node for a few hundred dollars and enforce these rules themselves. And right now there's already thousands of people all over the world doing this. One of Bitcoin's killer features is that it's software that can be updated, but unlike Apple pushing updates to your iPhone, there's no CEO or company that can push through changes. Bitcoin's rules are strict and the governance process looks nothing like a top-down organization. With no one in control, Bitcoin's governance is slow, messy, and full of debate. Every change goes through open discussion among the community and peer review. And at the center of this process is something called Bitcoin Improvement Proposals, otherwise known as BIPs. You can think of these like bills in government. Developers draft proposals for changes to the software, and then the community debates and reviews them before they can move forward. And to get a BIP activated into the software, you need broad support among the community. Miners are like lobbyists. They signal support by including messages in the blocks they mine. Once a high threshold is reached, often around 90%, the code is considered activated like a bill being signed into law. But just like laws mean nothing without courts to enforce them, Bitcoin's rules only matter if nodes decide to accept them. The nodes are the ultimate enforcement mechanism like courts and police. So even if an update gets activated, nodes get to choose whether or not they adopt and enforce those rules. And these upgrades happen in two different different ways, soft forks and hard forks. Soft forks tighten the rules in a way that's compatible with older versions of the software. And then hard forks loosen the rules in a way that breaks compatibility. So if you don't upgrade, you won't recognize that new version as valid and the network splits in two. If we go back to the soccer analogy, developers are like the coaches. A soft fork is like a coach asking the team to wear new shoes. It doesn't change the rules, but they can now run faster and play differently, and the refs still agree that it's within the rule book. A hard fork would be like the coach asking his team to play soccer underwater. It's still soccer in name, but now you need scuba gear, new rules, and a whole new setup. The coaches would have to convince all of the refs and players to follow them underwater because those on land won't recognize the game anymore. At that point, you don't just have a variation of soccer, you've created two separate sports. Soft forks keep everyone together and hard forks create a split. And in 2015, a disagreement over an update triggered a three year long civil war known as the block size wars. And this period taught us critical lessons about influence, control, and who really decides Bitcoin's future. So let's start with the block size and what really sparked the war. Bitcoin's block size refers to how many transactions and data can fit into each block mined every 10 minutes. Think of this like a highway. Cars are transactions and each block is a stretch of road that opens every 10 minutes. The highway only has so much space, so when traffic builds up, things slow down. And expanding or restricting space comes with trade-offs. This debate starts with the rule that Satoshi implemented in 2010, which was a one megabyte cap on block size. And this wasn't an issue at first, but five years later, blocks started to fill up and transactions were slowing down, so the community started to get a little worried about this. This is where the Civil War began, and the community separated into two camps. The big blockers wanted to expand the highway. More lanes meant more cars, lower tolls, and faster adoption. But the trade-off was higher infrastructure costs, making it harder for everyday users to stand by the road and check that every car was following the rules. The small blockers wanted to keep the road narrow. Fewer cars per block meant higher tolls, but the upside was that anyone could still afford to run a node and personally verify the traffic. 
To the small blockers, giving users the ability to run a node at a cheap cost was critical for long-term decentralization. And they also thought that high fees were healthy as it acted as a financial incentive for miners to keep mining as the block rewards decline long term. On the big blocker side, we have Gavin Andreessen, who once worked directly with Satoshi, and Mike Hearn, another respected early developer. Many other entrepreneurs and businesses joined them, hoping Bitcoin could scale fast enough to rival Visa. On the small blocker side were most of the core developers, researchers, and thousands of everyday users running nodes. They argued that if blocks got too big, only corporations could run nodes and Bitcoin would lose its decentralization. People like Greg Maxwell, Adam Back, Luke Dasher, and countless anonymous node operators pushed back to defend this vision. And both sides believed that they were protecting Bitcoin's future. One side was focused on shorter term adoption and the other side was focused on long term resilience and decentralization. At its core, this was a clash between short term growth and long term survival. And this tension turned a technical debate into Bitcoin's civil war. In 2015, the first major battle began when Gavin Andreessen, Satoshi's former lead developer, teamed up with Mike Hearn to release Bitcoin XT. Instead of going through the normal Bitcoin improvement proposal governance process, they bypassed it and released XT as a hard fork. When it launched, it immediately raised the block size from one megabyte to eight megabytes with plans to double every two years until it reached eight gigabytes. Both developers assumed that their reputation in the community would be enough to convince businesses and miners to switch to the new version and that this momentum would force the rest of the network to follow. For a short period of time, it looked like they might succeed. Some miners did signal support, but most node operators never switched over. They kept running Bitcoin Core and rejecting any blocks that were over one megabyte. This was Bitcoin's first major governance test. Could two influential developers push through a major update on their own? XT never gained adoption, and by early 2016, the project was dead. Other developer-led forks around the same time period were Bitcoin Unlimited and Bitcoin Classic, and they failed for the same reason. Without node consensus, none of these upgrades could survive. Mike Hearn walked away from Bitcoin entirely, and his farewell blog post said that he was done and that he'd sold all of his coins. At the time, Bitcoin's price was only $400, and many outside observers wondered if this was the end. But it wasn't. Bitcoin didn't fail. What failed failed was the idea that developers, even respected ones, could push through an update without consensus. So lesson one of the block size wars is that developers can write code, but only nodes decide whether to run it. After XT failed, the big blockers regrouped with a new strategy. If developers couldn't force a change, maybe industry leaders and big businesses could. By 2017, blocks were still filling up and transaction fees were rising. And this is when small block core developer Peter Woolley's proposal came to the forefront called SegWit. This was a soft fork upgrade that was backwards compatible with older versions, but reorganized data in each block to make room for more transactions. You can think of this like packing a suitcase with vacuum sealed bags. The suitcase stays the same size, but it holds a lot more. Most small blockers were in support of SegWit because it expanded capacity without increasing the cost of running a node. Because as more data is crammed into each block, the hardware that you need to run a node becomes more expensive. But the big blockers weren't satisfied. They still wanted a block size increase. So Barry Silbert of Digital Currency Group then organized a backroom deal in New York with the largest exchanges, miners, and businesses, including Coinbase and Bitmain. Together, they represented most of Bitcoin's financial and mining power. This New York agreement was a two-step plan. First, they would adopt SegWit and then double the block size with a hard fork called SegWit 2X. What looked like a compromise at first was really a plan for corporations and miners to force through an upgrade outside of Bitcoin's normal governance process. SegWit required miner signaling, but most of the major miners refused. They held SegWit hostage while still pushing for a block size increase. And as a response, an anonymous developer by the name of Shaolin Fry on the small block side released BIP 148 the user activated soft fork known as UASF. It let node runners set a deadline, so after August 1st, 2017, their nodes would reject any blocks from miners who hadn't adopted SegWit. You can think of this like courts and police approaching lawmakers saying, from August 1st onward, we'll only enforce laws that include SegWit. Any other law will be ignored. 
Suddenly, the lawmakers and lobbyists knew that unless they fell in line, their work would be worthless. The stakes here were enormous because if too few nodes adopted SegWit, they risked splitting the chain in half and becoming the minority blockchain. But node runners called their bluff and won. On August 1st, 2017, SegWit was activated. Miners capitulated rather than wasting resources mining invalid blocks. A few months later, the planned SegWit 2x hard fork collapsed. Businesses and miners abandoned it, and core development moved forward with SegWit as the standard. So lesson two of the block size wars is that no amount of corporate money, exchange power, or miner signaling can overpower the nodes without consensus. But the story doesn't end here. If developers and businesses couldn't force a change, maybe miners with all of their hash power could. And this leads us to the finale. The final battle of the block size wars came in 2017 when the big blockers launched their own version of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Cash. Leading it was Roger Ver, a well-known Bitcoin evangelist known as Bitcoin Jesus and owner of Bitcoin.com. He believed that Bitcoin's true purpose was as electronic cash, and he argued that small blockers had abandoned that vision. He partnered with Jihan Wu, founder of Bitmain and one of the largest mining companies in the world, and together they pushed Bitcoin Cash live. On August 1st, Bitcoin split, and Bitcoin holders kept their Bitcoin but also got an equal amount in the new coin. Bitcoin Cash launched with 8 megabyte blocks, allowing for more transactions and lower fees. Backed by a massive marketing push, Roger and Jihan convinced some of the largest miners in the space to switch over. Exchanges like Coinbase started listing it for sale, and for a few months the price did surge, making some of the small blockers uneasy. But like the two battles before it, most node runners never switched over. So Bitcoin Cash had less nodes, weaker decentralization, and very little use beyond speculation. All of the small blockers immediately sold their Bitcoin Cash, creating sell-side pressure, and eventually all of the miners slowly moved back to Bitcoin because it was more profitable to mine. Bitcoin Cash peaked in late 2017, and since then it's never recovered. And today it's down 97% against Bitcoin since it was released. Even with the top miners, exchanges, and influential voices in Bitcoin behind it, Bitcoin Cash couldn't replace Bitcoin. The block size wars taught a clear lesson. No amount of power, money, or influence could change Bitcoin's rules without agreement from users running nodes. Developers fail with XT, businesses fail with SegWit2x, and miners fail with Bitcoin Cash. And this is a powerful idea at the core of what makes Bitcoin unlike any other asset on the planet. Bitcoin's consensus rules and monetary policy are locked in code. Its governance makes it robust and resistant to change, battle-tested and proven in the face of adversity. The network ultimately chose smaller blocks, prioritizing decentralization over short-term adoption of payments. What this means for Bitcoin in the future is that no government can shut it down, no corporation can control it. And as Bitcoin adoption spreads to the world, it's important for node runners to remember the lessons of the block size wars. So who really controls Bitcoin? It's people like you and me. You can make a choice about which software implementation you want to run, use it to verify your own transactions, and enforce those rules on the network. So if you hold Bitcoin, I encourage you to learn how to run a node, verify your own transactions because you realize that you can be your own bank and help keep Bitcoin decentralized. My name is Austin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.